Iron City built. It's time for the Steel City Nation podcast. Here's your host, Mark Maraday. Steel City Nation, um, I'd like to welcome my guest today, legendary offensive tackle from the Washington Redskins, Chris Samuels. Chris, how's life treating you today? I'm doing great, man. Just wrestling with the kids this morning. My wife has them right now, cooking them breakfast, and the babysitter should probably be here in another 20 minutes. So everything is great. It sounds like life is good at your end. It looks nice and sunny where you are, too. It, 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 nice down there, huh? Yeah, no doubt about it. Uh, everything is good, man. We're really blessed, even though we're going through a tough time as a nation. Yeah, we are. It's it, We're all over the board right now. It's crazy to watch, see, listen. Um, I pray for us every day really hard. <laughs> yes, yes, me too. So, Chris, lifelong football player. Did you know from the time you were a young guy you were headed for – for Division One football, you, you know it's crazy because um, when I was a young boy, um, I was three years old, and my I had three older brothers, and my mom signed all of them up to play little league football down in Mobile, Alabama, and I wanted to play, and my brothers were trying to get me to play, but then she found out I was too young to start at that age, and I remember my mom said, um, "Well, can he be a cheerleader or do something?" And my older brothers was like, "No, that ain't happening. We're not." Gonna play <laughs> So it's crazy. So the next year I actually started playing at four. They went ahead and let me slide up to play with the five-year-olds. Yeah. And I was on my um, my brother that's right over me, Dexter's team. And uh, then I have two older brothers over him. But I was on his team, and I really didn't play much. I didn't really know what I was doing. And um, I would only go in and clean up games or whatever. So um, my oldest two brothers, they kept working with me, working with me. And then the next year I wound up being the star of the team. And, uh, you know, on my own team. So basically, um, you know, I always would tell my mom that I'm going to the NFL, tell people I'm going to the NFL. People would just laugh at me. I remember times, and we grew up middle class, times we were doing pretty good, times we were doing, you know, struggling-wise or whatever. And we walked through the mall or whatever, and we would see nice things. And and uh, I would tell my mom, we rich, let's buy that. We rich, let's buy that. My mom would always say, we're not rich, we can't afford that. And I was like, well, let's pretend we rich, because one day I'm going to the NFL. So as a child, you know, around five, six, seven, eight years old, I always believed it. But then, you know, reality sets in and, you know, I'm a decent player, but I'm not the greatest player. I'm going into middle school and I'm on the team and I'm catching passes and doing certain things. But I wasn't like the star four or five guys on the team. Then even going into high school, I wasn't always the big time guy. Um, only until my junior and senior year when I had this big growth spurt you know, and they moved me from tight end to left tackle when I really started dominating at the position. When, really, when people start catching wind, that I could possibly be a D1 guy, possibly going to the NFL. But, um, you know, I, I really didn't know at that time because there were so many guys better than me. Then once I got to college, it was a whole new ball game. then. You know, I'm the big dog coming from high school. Now I'm playing with these guys, you know, full facial hair. You know, these guys are 320 pounds, ripped up guys. And, you know, I was a red shirt guy. You know, I was a crybaby. I mentally wasn't tough enough or strong enough. And at that time, I was like, man, I don't think I can go to the NFL. And then the guys that I'm going against at practice that's on the starting defense, I'm on a scout team, and I'm trying to block these guys, give them a look for the upcoming game against Tennessee or LSU. And these guys are just running through me at practice. There's nothing that I can do with them in my red shirt freshman year. And I'm watching these guys go pro, and they're all getting cut, you know, after that. So I'm in my head like I'm not good enough. But then, you know, things ironed out. I kept working hard, working hard. And then I wind up being a four-year starter from a red shirt freshman, sophomore, uh, junior, and then a senior, and wind up getting drafted. I know I was long-winded, but I gave you the whole story. So, no, but you know, I'm never when I see you now. You know, I'm never going to look at you the same. I'm going to think, Mel cheerleader. Here goes Chris. I know, right? Can you, <laughs> can you imagine me with pom poms or doing a split? <laughs> no. No, I just mean, knowing you personally, I can't see that. Not at all. Yeah, yeah, but but nowadays, at least the guys get the whole the, the cute girls up, so maybe it would have worked out, you know. Yes, sir. <laughs> yes, sir. You got it. You got yourself a catch there, though, and you're white, so ain't no doubt about it. I don't want no other woman. That's the, the perfect woman for me. She's beautiful, smart, great mom, great wife, and you know we both compromise to make it work. Hey. Did anybody else talk to you besides Alabama? Did you think about going anywhere else but Alabama? Let me ask you that. Actually, I did. And um, because I'm kind of like a guy that's, you know, um, a loyal guy in a sense. Um, the first team to really – well, uh, I went on an unofficial visit to Southern Miss. The Miss was just unofficial. But um, uh, what was it? Auburn was the first team to really officially offer me a full-time 
a full ride scholarship. So uh, I really consider Auburn hard, even though I grew up a Bama fan. Every now and then, Auburn will be doing well when Bo Jackson played those guys. So I supported them, but I was always deep inside Bear Bryant and always an Alabama guy. But I entertained Auburn really hard because they were the first ones to reach out, you know. So um, Mississippi State, Auburn, I wasn't highly recruited at all. Actually, a friend of mine that played safety in high school with me, he was the big time recruit. And uh, he wound up getting a scholarship with me to the University of Alabama as well. And unfortunately, he tore his knee up his senior year and he was playing out of control. I mean, leading in sacks, tackles, blocking, you know, field goals, he was balling. And he blew his knee out, I think, the fourth or the fifth game of his senior year. And he still got two pro trials, Tennessee Titans and, and uh, Miami Dolphins, but he just didn't run as well. So he never really made it into the NFL, played a little bit of arena ball. And now he's actually the defensive coordinator at Jacksonville State. Oh. So he's doing, yeah, he's doing really, really well now. He's an awesome coach, and uh, he's a good friend of mine, one of my best friends. I actually worked under him one year at Blunt High School in Mobile, Alabama. He was a head coach. So when I injured my neck and retired in the, uh, from the Redskins, I interned under the Shanahan's for one full year. That's why I learned a great deal about how to coach offense. Yeah. And then I quit from that job and went down to Mobile, Alabama for one year and coached under my friend as the offensive coordinator at Blunt High School. We had a really good year. We, I think we went nine and two. We lost to my nephew's team second round of the playoffs. And then we wound up going to, uh, we both, you know, got word that Nick Saban wanted us to work for him. So we both went back to our alma mater and we worked for Nick Saban. And from there, he took off into the college world. I had two pro opportunities and um, I had a few college opportunities, but I had just taken a job at Osborne High School once I left Alabama and I spent yeah. three years there. Yeah. And and, and I, I just couldn't get on, quit on the kids. I just took the job. So I turned Lovey Smith down when he was in Tampa and the Chicago Bears as well. Um, but my boy took off. He's having a great college coaching career, and I'm proud of him. Going back to Coach Saban, what's special about him? Like, what pulls people into playing for him? I, I get the record. I get mm -hmm. the history. I get his production of players that go to the league and have successful careers. But what's special about that guy when he comes to your house and he sits down and talks to you? You know, it, it's so many different things what's special about him. First of all, he's a good man. He's a good person. Now, with me saying that, it's not like, you know, he's going to go come in there and just love on you all day. And when you play for him, he's going to love on you all day. He, he is going to love on you, but it's going to be tough love. And I respect that. You don't want a coach that's going to, you know, sugarcoat things. He's up forward. He's straightforward. He lets people know what he wants. He runs the building, you know, from top down. And he's in charge. And I think that's the beautiful thing about it. When you're the head coach, you need to be in charge of pretty much everything from recruiting to how the equipment room is ran, from how, you know, um, the training room is ran. Yeah. I mean, you know, the scheme and everything. But, you know, just a dominant personality. Um, he's going to, you know, treat you fair, but he's not going to promise anything. Um, you got to go in there and you got to work your butt off. He promises the opportunity that you can earn a starting job. He's not going to give it to you, like I said. But um, I, I really like them. I mean, you know, I really admire working for them. Very organized to the T, workaholic, always trying to get the edge, but doing it the right way. And I really respect Coach Saban because he gave me an opportunity to come work up under him and learn from him. So when I was at the high school, like I told you a minute ago, uh, they, he asked me, did I want to come do some something with the university? At that time, I hadn't graduated from college, so I needed a college degree. So I went back to school as a student coach for two years. Uh, and I finished my degree. And once I graduated, you know, he wanted me to stick around. So he hired me as player development, played me, paid me great money, mentored the guys, helped out with football stuff, helped out coaching from a side, you know, just on the sideline, just kind of like maybe like just sending a guy in the game and out because it's illegal for me to actually coach. Right. You know, those guys, they had position coaches. But, you know, sometimes I'll rotate personnel like, all right, you know, you go, you go. But, you know, it's, you know, as far as being hands-on schematics-wise, I, illegally, I couldn't do that. And that's why I respect Coach Saban because he did it the right way. You're not going to go in there and cut corners and try to get an edge the wrong way. You're going to work your butt off and do it the right way. And then, you know, if I'm a guy in high school and he comes to recruit me, I'm going to look at his track record of, you know, how many guys have been going pro lately up under Coach Saban. And most of those kids, they want to go pro. A lot of them come from you know, homes where they financially don't have a whole lot of money and they're looking at football as their way out to way, a, a way to make it in life. I know I did. And when Coach Saban comes in there, I'm going to, you know, pull out and look at his track record and look at all of these guys that's been going, you know, top 10 or first round or second round. 
And it's a no brainer for me. I'm going to Alabama. First of all, it's a great school, a great tradition, the only school, the best school. And now we have the best coach. What's crazy to me is he came out to visit literally one of your current players or would be yes, your current player. I, you know, and I, and I was actually doing something at the school the time I saw him come by. Long story short, it's crazy to me. Like, I felt like that player didn't even really entertain going there. And I was kind of like, wow, that's Alabama. You're you're going to – that's Coach it, Saban. It, it's so crazy because, you know, the player or whatever, I don't know if you want to say his name. I don't think it's a big deal anyway. But right. – um, I love the guy. I mean, he's an awesome football player, you know, and I put in, you know, the West Coast NFL passing scheme. And I knew that we would take off with the type of athletes that I had at Northwest. And, um, you know, he basically asked me one day, he said, do you think I'm good enough to play at Alabama? I said, hell yeah, you are like, you can play anywhere that you want to play. I said, to be honest, the way you're built right now, your speed, your strength, your size, I said, you probably can make it in the NFL right now, you know? So um, I don't know if he believed it. I think he believes it now, but he never really entertained them like, you know, that I, like I wanted him to, but I'm not a guy that's going to force Alabama on anybody. He has to make a choice for himself. He has to be happy because I would feel awful if I pushed him to go to Alabama and things didn't work out and he didn't actually choose it for himself. So, um, you know, but, you know, coach came in, and, uh, you know, um, you know, uh, the, the offensive coordinator and different people that come in and yeah. they would talk about him and I would draw up stuff and say, well, he knows this, he knows that because it's, you know, at that time he was a junior, so it was illegal for them to actually meet with him, but they were interested in him. So I would just draw the schematics and they was like, wow, he knows this, he knows that. And I was like, yeah, I taught these kids Shanahan West Coast passing that. Yeah, it, it just amazes me uh, the options that he had. And I've worked very closely with him um, academically, you know, just some of that stuff. So I was mm -hmm. nothing but the ultimate success. Um, so you, let's go back to your friend for a second, who's the D.C. At, at Jacksonville State. He had a tough obstacle coming out of college, blew the knee out. What's the toughest obstacle you you faced as a as a college player? Uh, well, I'll tell you one thing that I struggled with um, in high school, my senior year, and I'm playing out of control, I'm playing offense and defense. And I actually, um, it was the 10th game of the year. Whoever wins this game is going to be the deciding factor to who's going to go to the playoffs. And if we were playing against LaFleur High School, I played at Shaw High School, and I hit a kid. And once I hit him, and it was a big, intense game, you know, so I, I hit a guy and everything went numb. I mean, totally like numb. My whole body just shut down. I lost power. So um, they had to take me off, you know, on the ambulance and, you know, and, you know, strap me down and everything. So I go and get the checkup and I get like the MRIs and stuff done. I find out I have spinal stenosis. Oh, two doctors told me that I would never play again because my discs were that narrow and tight against my spinal cord. And it was like, you know, you're at a higher risk of, you know, paralysis. So um, that was devastating because I had all my eggs in one basket, to be honest with you. Yeah. I wasn't a great student. I didn't want to do anything else outside of playing football, except for maybe coaching football. And in my mind, I wanted to play in the NFL and then coach when I was done. So um, that was a tough deal. But then eventually I got like one or two more doctors to check me out and they approved me to play. So I received my scholarship. And at that time, a lot of schools backed off of me because they thought I would never play again. So that was one thing you know, just overcoming that and then having the confidence to go play, knowing that I had this condition, yeah. knowing what it felt like to hit a guy and everything goes paralyzed. But, you know, to answer your question, in college, one of the toughest things I had to deal with was, you know, my red shirt freshman year. When I first got there, I was totally out of shape, mentally wasn't tough enough, physically wasn't tough enough. When we would do our 6 a.m. mat drills, when it's real intense and the coaches are yelling at 6 a.m. in the morning, you know, all the other, most of the other guys were like, going through the drills like grown men. Yeah. For me, on the other hand, I was out there a crybaby, couldn't finish. They would just send me to the side by myself to bear crawl. People don't know this story about me, but I wasn't always the, you know, the, the strong-minded, tough guy on the field. You know, I, I was kind of in a child's mindset, and they raised me up to be a tough, you know, grown man when they was done with me. So I remember, um, you know, every day they would just, you know, yell at me, send me to the side. I couldn't keep up with the rest of the guys. Finally, I said, I'm not getting beat today. I made my mind up. I said, I'm going to finish these whole, every drill. And I finished all, I, we, I went around to every station. I'm dog dead tired. And then you have to end on your actual position coach, whatever drill he ran. 
and it was like seat roll. So you get on your hands and knees and you pump your feet and you got to roll left, roll right. And I'm already tired from doing all of the running and everything and all the other stations. And he, every time I would get in there, he would try to break me because he knew he could break me. And it's Danny Pierman. Actually, he's at Clemson now, the tight ends coach now. Okay. So, so, uh, I just went crazy. I just started screaming and yelling. I was just like, ah, boom, ah, boom. So I'm doing my drills. And I finally finished. And Danny told me, he said, he said, Chris, I'm so proud of you. You finally manned up. You finally finished. You finally overcame it. And then I looked at him and I just threw up everywhere. <laughs> All over the turf. I mean, it went everywhere. <laughs> so, so the strength coach, TJ at the time, TJ came to me. And he just said, TJ said, you know what? I'm proud of you. You actually finished. He said, now go on and get that dustpan and clean that SHIT up off my floor. <laughs> well, you, can't, you can't make a mess without getting it cleaned up. I That's mean, right. But but that was probably the toughest thing, to be honest with you. Just, you know, overcoming, not being ready, not being confident, you know, not preparing myself, not being mentally tough. And once I turned that corner that day, it was no turning back from then on out. Yeah, I can imagine. Hey. Take me through draft night at the Samuels residence. Where actually you were you were at the at the place uh, draft night, right? Because you yes. knew what's going on. Yeah, So um, I actually um, went up to the draft. I had my family with me, my best friend uh, Beef at the time. His nickname was Beef. It's Derek McKenzie. And uh, and then uh, my ex girlfriend, she came up with me. She went to college with me, and it was uh, a blessing because um, my grandparents live in New York, and my grandfather. You know, he's passed, he passed away years ago. My grandmother's 96 in a nursing home in Virginia Beach where my parents live. She beat COVID and everything, you know. Oh, wow. and, oh she's a tough cookie now. But it was a blessing because they lived in New York, you know, their whole lives pretty much. And they came down from Jamaica, Queens to actually be at the whole ceremony with me. So that was truly a blessing, you know, to see them there. And they were so proud of me and uh, to see me get drafted in the NFL and it was just a great night, you know, just to know that I'm going to be a, a top five pick in the draft. You know, you have players like Courtney Brown, LeVar Arrington, Peter Ward. You know, you had all of these fantastic players and to know that you're going to be right there with them. It was a blessing. I mean, the cameras are there. Everybody's focused on you. And, uh, you know, everybody back at home is rooting for you and cheering for you. It was a special moment because it was my dream to actually make it to the NFL but I didn't just make it in like barely, you know, seventh round or a free agent deal. I mean, I was the third pick overall. So that was just a blessing. God actually, you know, opened up the doors to me and I worked my butt off, but he protected me from serious injuries. He allowed me to come back and play from a neck injury, even though I, you know, that uh, situation would never go away. So I dealt with that throughout my pro career. We can get into that later if you want to, but um, you know, it was just a great deal. It was amazing. I, I feel like everybody, should be able to experience that if they could, but unfortunately, everybody can't. No, no. Right. Chris, when, and I, I meant to follow up. When you said spinal stenosis, isn't that the same thing Ryan Shazier experienced on his head? I, actually, I don't think so. I don't. I don't know the full story with him. I think with him, it is just he. Because I remember the hit when his the top of his crown of his helmet, he hit the guy in the back, I believe, right. Yeah, And what I think, all of his little discs that went down, I think they compressed. That's what I think happened. They compressed going, you know, and I think that that kind of, you know, messed up his spinal, his nerve cord, actually. So when you have spinal stenosis, normally you have all of these little bitty discs that make up your spine, right? And it's okay. supposed to be a circle shape. Well, when you, and your nerve cord goes down the middle. Right. Well, when you have spinal stenosis, you have narrow discs. You oh, see, right. now it's more of an oval shape. Okay. So, if this is normal, you see how much room I have? Yes. All right. If this is narrow, now you can see that it's condensing. So when I take a hit on my neck and I get hit with too much force, it pinches the nerve core and everything shuts down right. for seconds. And, and it's burning sensation. You lose power. You lose it in your legs, your arms, depending on how severe it is. And it's a scary moment. You know, finally, you know, I mean, I've had the worst one I probably had was when we played um Arizona and I was going against Simeon Rice and we had been going back and forth jaw jacking the whole game and this is the last game of the season my rookie year and we collided helmet to helmet I totally collapsed on the ground I lost all feeling in my upper extremities and lower extremities and for probably two months literally had burning sensation and pain from nerve damage throughout my body I was waking up with nightmares and everything else you know kind of of the incident of me getting hit but literally, I had to go see Dr. Watkins, which was one of the best 
spinal uh, guys in the, in, the, in the nation, and he had to clear me to play again. And one, one thing, credit to uh, Mr. Snyder with the Redskins, a lot of people don't know this, but uh, once I was getting ready to get drafted, I'm going to be this high pick. Um, I think it was the Pittsburgh Steelers went back into my high school medical records. And that's because I, I had no problems through college, thank God. And they went through my high school medical records and they actually found this issue. So now my agent is telling me, you probably, you know, possibly can go from a top 10 pick now and drop down to third or fourth round. And they want to get you as a steal. That's why they brought this out. And, um, you know, the owner of the Redskins found out about it. You know, their doctors got on it. And he said, I don't care. He said, if North wants him, then that's who we're getting. If Russ Graham wants him, that's who we get. I'm taking a chance on him anyway. So I appreciate that because, you know, the third pick in the draft totally changed my life, you know, from um, a financial standpoint and just giving me, you know, an opportunity to play for the, you know, the Burgundy and Gold, the Washington team. Yeah. And, you know, it was just amazing. And I still live in the area today. I love it here. Yeah. And you lived up to the hype. You never really, I mean, I know you had some, some later on uh, injuries with the neck, but I mean, you've lived mm -hmm. up to the hype in every way, sense and shape. Uh, what was it like walking in that pro locker room first time? What was that? It was, it, it was exciting. And I'll tell you why, even though I was a 49er fan growing up and I always loved Jerry Rice, Joe Montana, John Taylor, Brent Jones, Tom Rapman, Ricky Waters, uh, Steve Young. I can go on and off, you know, about the team, Ronnie Lott and all of the defensive guys. But I always, I, I never really disliked the Redskins. You know, when they went to the Super Bowls, I would cheer for them. Because I always liked the power run game. I liked the Hogs. But I was diehard 49er guy. But when I went into the – and then I used to play this video game. And you probably remember. Remember Tecmo Bowl on Nintendo? Yeah, absolutely. So I used, to play, I used to play that game. And I remember, you know, Bruce Smith on there. I remember Daryl Green and Mark Carrier and all of these different guys. And now I'm walking in the locker room and I'm like, wow, I'm here with these guys. Like, you know, I'm their teammate, you know. And that's when they really sunk in that I made it. And, you know, the Reds, you know, playing for the Redskins and, you know, I'm in the DMV. So it was exciting, man. And those guys embraced me and took me in. One guy that I had a little bit of an issue with, though, uh, like Bruce Smith was right next to me, his locker next to me. And uh, and um, it was, I can't think of his name right now, um, defensive end, the other defensive end, Mark, uh, Marco Coleman. Oh, so I remember that dude. They, yeah. They, yeah, they were right beside me. They raised me up, you know. So, but, and Big Daddy was real cool. Most of the vets were real cool, but one guy that I actually really looked up to was Dana Stubberfield because he was a 49er guy. Yeah. So sure. when I got there the first day and I met him, I was so excited. And I was like, man, I said, man, I said, I was a big fan growing up, you know, watching you. I was a big 49er fan. You're a great player. Rookie, rookie, just chill out. Everything will be cool. Just chill out. And he kind of played me a little bit. So all of a sudden in the locker room, my cell phone would ring. He would go snatch my phone and answer. I'm like, bro, that's my phone, you know. And I'm trying to be nice and trying to be humble. But I'm like, all right, he's testing me. So then we finally get in full gear. We get out there on the field. And the first day of practice, I block him two or three times. Rookie, stop holding me. Rookie, stop holding me. You know, so I'm like, all right, man, this dude keep trying me. And one day he was like, rookie, I'm telling you, you hold me again, it's on. So I blocked him and he slugged me in my face mask. I went off. Ba -ba 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 -ba. I mean, I gave him like a 10 piece. And I said, I've been waiting on this. I, I said, you've been playing me like a B since I got here. And I said, I don't play all of that. From then on out, we actually wind up being pretty cool. What's up, Big Chris? What's up, Big Chris? So I think I earned the respect, but I kind of had to fight to get the respect. That must have been kind of disheartening because you're looking at this guy, you're like, man, that's my boy. He played for that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know. I mean, it is what it is. But I, at that time, it's not like, you know, I was dying for acceptance. Yeah. You know, I just looked up to him. I watched him. I thought he was a great player. He played for the team that I loved at one time. But he kind of played me a little bit. But, we, you know, it all worked itself out. You know, unfortunately, you know, um, sometimes only violence, you know, you know, cures the situation. I, in a football field, though, I mean, it's natural to happen that you're going to get into it. it, it people mm. don't understand that. They don't get it. You are going to get into it even with your best friend on a football field. It's what happens when you walk off the field. Coaches get into it. Players get into it. Players and coaches, you know, it, it just happens. Am I, am I right? Right. Yeah, it is true. I mean, anytime you're in a physical sport like football, you know, you're taught to be aggressive. So every now and then somebody's going to block somebody or hold somebody or cheap shot somebody. It can even be an accident, you know, at practice and tempers flare because you're already in an intense situation. 
a lot of times it's either freezing cold or it's, you know, 85, I mean, not 85, it's like 95 or 100 degrees out there, yeah. high humidity. So you're already in a, a stressful situation and you're tired. You might be three weeks into it. You've been going two a days every day. So sometimes people get irritated yeah. and it is what it is. You're going to fight at practice. Um, sometimes guys fighting games, which you shouldn't because you'll get fined. But I think, you know, what you said a minute ago, what's most important is leave it on the field. You know, we would always say that. You fight on the field, you get into a scuffle, we're still teammates. Yeah. So just let it go. The problem is when it carries on into the locker room, our coaches take it up into the office and they get into it. That's when you start to tear down your organization. I remember, uh, and I believed in like, you know, guys fighting that practice. If one D lineman got into it with an O lineman, I believed in the whole O line fights the D line. And now that I look back at it, it's not smart for your whole team to be fighting each other. But that's just the way we rolled at that time. If one of my buddies on the O-line was, you know, fighting, then it's 10 of us coming as O-line and then it's 10 D-linemen. But if you really think about it, it makes sense of it. We're the same team. We shouldn't be doing that. One smart coach taught me to think outside of the box and think different is when I went to the University of Alabama. Yeah. Back to work up under Coach Saban. Coach Saban does not allow guys fighting at practice. Now, at times, guys might scuffle a little bit and he'll discipline hard, hard for that. But he was like, we're, we're the same team. We got to go to war together. Why are we sitting here fighting each other? And the light bulb went off. It makes sense. So anytime that I coach, I don't encourage that, you know, as a coach, as far as in one fight, then your unit goes against another unit, especially when we're all Northwest. Yeah, exactly. You said that, that Bruce Smith and, and Marco Coleman, because they were on either side of you in that locker room, were influences. Who do you feel was your biggest influence growing up in the game of football? Um, my biggest influence actually is is my um, second oldest brother, Lawrence Samuels. I think he played like 18 years of arena ball. He has like a three arena bowl championships. He actually got double MVP honors. I think that's the first time that it ever happened at that time, meaning offense and defensive MVP. Um, I mean, just an awesome football player in high school. In our neighborhood, he was always a star, whether it was baseball, football, basketball. I mean, he was so talented. And he actually taught me the game. So he's the biggest influence on actually teaching me how to play. I remember as a little kid in the yard, I'm three and four years old. He's the one teaching me when you're running the ball on the sideline and the sideline is uh, near the sideline and the sideline is on your right hand side. You put the ball in your right hand and you stiff arm with your left hand. I remember him teaching me that in the front living room. We go play this rival park in Little League. Uh, and I'm, a, I'm five at the time. And we play them and I you know, ran, I think, a sweep or a quarterback sweep to the right. Um, I broke out, took it 70 yards, but one kid almost tackled me and I stiffed on him to the ground. He just taught me that the night before. So he taught me the game. You know, he taught me how to play pursuit of angles, tackling, and all of these different things, you know, from, you know, little league standpoint. And even in high school would give me pointers when I played. And then, you know, once I got into the pros, uh, I'm going to tell you one guy, and I hadn't talked about him, you know, Russ Rand was an awesome coach. He helped me out a lot. Bruce Smith gave me a lot of pointers on, you know, what defensive ends tendencies are, what they're thinking, Marco Coleman as well. But the biggest influence on me, and I love this guy to this day, even when he retired and was coaching in Jacksonville, every time we played him, I would go hug his neck and tell him thank you. Every time I see him. Remember Andy Heck from Notre Dame that played yes, with I the Redskins? Absolutely. Played in Seattle. Awesome. Awesome. Yes, awesome guy. And I'm going to tell you why. Normally in NFL, you have older guys they don't really help rookies, most of them, because the rookies are there to do what? Take their job. Yeah. My rookie year, Andy Heck, I think at the time, was maybe a, a 13, 14-year vet, and he knew that his body was, you know, getting old. He couldn't do what he used to could do, and he was winding down. He's getting ready to retire. But it's, And they're bringing me in to take his job from day one, you know? Yeah. Instead of shawning me away or mistreating me or whatever, he was very mature, drank his coffee, legs crossed, and he taught me the game. I was sitting, and even though sometimes I'm tired, you know, the rookie wall, you get tired, you fall asleep in the meetings, you can't stay up, because, you know, you're still a fresh out of college kid, and you're trying to party at night and still trying to, you know, whatever. Andy taught me the game. He said, all right, when you're in the red zone, he said, um, and you're about to score, you're on maybe like the 10-yard line, he said, you might not want to take a deeper pass set. He said, for the simple fact, the ball's going to come out quick. Receivers' routes are not as deep. You know, little bitty tips like that, Andy Heck taught me a lot. And every time that I see him, I said, man, thank you, man. You were really good to me. He was all, oh, no, it's not a big deal. I'm like, no, you could have mistreated me. 
and and you didn't. So I the most respect for Andy. Now he's probably still in the league coaching somewhere now. Hey, am I correct? He was a number one for Seattle back in the day, and then he came to the Redskins. Am I right? I'm really not sure. That that's a possibility. But I know when I you know because I really didn't know much about Andy Hicks before. Because like I said, I was dialed in 49ers, and I was dialed in Dallas because my best friend was a Dallas Cowboy fan. And, you know, back in the day, they used to have some good wars to make it to the Super Bowl. So yeah. I really didn't pay that much attention to other guys. Okay. But uh, but I know when I when I came here, Andy was here. And, I mean, he taught me the game. He looked out for me big time. Is there a particular moment that you, like, had or a defining moment in your career, at least at the NFL level, that you um, hang your hat on? You know, so, something happened, and that was like, oh, Chris Samuels, he's the man. You know, um, I think I, I would have to say my second year in the NFL, uh, my, my rookie year, I had some games where I played outstanding. Then I had some games where it was terrible. I remember, I think I gave up maybe three sacks against Dallas my rookie year. And um, the last uh, one time the guy beat me so bad, I just dove on the ground and grabbed his ankle. He's trying to drag me to the quarterback. <laughs> I mean, it was, it was, so I had some good games, some bad games. But when Marty Schottenheimer came in, and he had an awesome strength coach. His nickname was Red Man. And those guys in the offseason, literally, I mean, the way they trained us was second to none. We didn't even run about the first two months of training. No running. We would just get on the bike and do, like, bike intervals. We would lift weights hard, heavy squats, power cleaners, power lifting. Then when we went out to run, finally, after probably, like, you know, uh, you know two months or whatever, I'm thinking I'm, we're going to be out of shape. But what he did, he built my win up on the, on, on the bike, built all of our win up. And I went out and ran, and I'm, we're running gashes, and I'm killing it because my win was, was right. And just the way they trained, I was in great shape. And Marty's scheme fit what I, I like to do is pound people in the run game, so it makes it that much easier to when he throws the ball. But that was the defining year for me because I think I gave up one sack all year long, and it was against uh, Hugh Douglas. He finally got me. I think it was off of T Stone or something. But that year, I mean, literally, I'm coming out of games four and five, six pancakes. I'm literally dominating people, and I'm. I think my weight was about three ten, but I'm going against guys three forty, three fifty. Now, the first quarter in the game, all right. Second quarter in the game, those guys, it's kind of like stalemate, stalemate, stalemate. But the problem for those guys was when you're 340 and you got all this extra fat on you, now you wear down. Yeah, That's where the conditioning that Red Man put into us, the training that he put into us, now I'm 310 and I'm running like a fine tooth machine now. I, I'm rolling now. I, I never lost a step. I, you know, I kept, you know, pounding those guys at full speed and I never wore down. Now the big guy's tired. Now I got him and I'm flat back in this guy. So that was kind of like a defining year for me. And I actually made the Pro Bowl my second year. I, I find it uh, interesting, not that I didn't know this, but I find it interesting how you're dipping into uh, a second layer of coaches that you work with that have actually made you as a professional at the level you played at. Because a lot of people don't understand that it's not the head coach per se. It's not even the coordinator or the O-line coach. It's the guy behind that that really takes that next level out of you because they work more directly with you that, that that's awesome to hear how it was your strength guy and how he was able to develop you um right. what what was it like when you and the family walked on the field in 2019 when you got honored in the uh, Redskins ring of honor T tell me about that tell, I know the listeners want to hear that because that was that was spectacular I, I was uh Personally, I was taken back just watching you go through that, uh, knowing what you were doing there. Thank you. I appreciate it. No, it, it was an amazing feeling. Uh, it was so it's so many great guys that played with the Redskins, outstanding football players. And every time I walk into that stadium, I would always glance up there and kind of just take a look at the names, you know. And, you know, unfortunately, I had to retire after 10 years in the NFL. I wanted to play 15. Yeah. But to be honored into the ring of fame, to have my loved ones there, my friends there. And it was a really, really downpour that, that day we played the 49ers. So the, pan, the fans was, uh, I mean, the, the stands wasn't that packed, but it was a nice amount of diehard fans there supporting the team. And just to be honored there and knowing that my name will forever be up there, it's a big deal, man. It's truly a blessing just to 
you know, know that you made such an impact on the team where they respected you enough to put you up there. Hey, hey, any goals you didn't reach while you were playing? In, any what now? Any goals? Is there anything you said, I'm going to do this, but you never got to that because your career was cut a little bit short? Uh, well, I always wanted to go to the Hall of Fame, and it's a slim chance I can get there. Maybe I will, maybe I don't, but I don't cry over it. And, and the reason why, I know my career was cut short. I had some good years, some bad years. I had some bad coaching in some of those years as well, so I'm not going to take all of the rap on that. But uh, at the end of the day, I, I don't I – don't, I don't really worry about all of that stuff. If the Hall of Fame happens, it happens. If it doesn't, it doesn't. I'm cool because remember back in high school, I wasn't supposed to be playing football. Yeah. The game that I loved, the game that I always played, the game that I worked so hard at, the dreams that I had, you know, within this game that I wanted, that could have been gone. So for me to actually receive a scholarship to the University of Alabama, play for them, to be the third pick overall, to make six Pro Bowls, to take my family to Hawaii, uh, financially, I'm set. Um, you know, I, I can't worry about what, you know, I, it's no other goals that I can worry about, you know. Right. And a lot a lot of people, they set for all of these goals, and I'm not hating on them by no means. I'm prouder to see guys, the guys that made the Hall of Fame and certain things that they achieved, Super Bowls and stuff like that. But I tell all the guys that's currently playing right now, listen, it's not about how many Pro Bowls. It's not about the Hall of Fame. It's not about all pros. It's not it, Super Bowl. None of that really yeah. matters. At the end of the day, I said, when you retire, you better have you some money. I said, because I know people selling Super Bowl rings, selling Pro Bowl jerseys and trophies just to try to make ends meet. So my whole thing is I'm blessed because, and I've made some mistakes. I've been, you know, I've dealt business with uh, crooks that taken advantage and stole money and stuff like that. But fortunately, you know, my family's straight. You know, I, I look at my kids. You know, I look at my wife. We live a great lifestyle. Uh, we're able to help other people. I'm able to volunteer at Northwest and help out. That way, uh, Coach Newbys can actually pay another coach to help coach the team. That's a quality coach. And I'm blessed, man. So I tell them, you know, keep your money. But as far as goals and stuff like that, I did everything that I wanted to do. If other things happen, then I'm cool with it. If it don't, if it doesn't, then it doesn't. Did they sit you down? and say, here's the way you should take a financial path? Or do they just kind of, you know, you've earned the money, you do what you need to with it when you first for, come to the league? For the most part, um, they do have, you know, um, different people to come in and talk to you about how to manage your money. You know, financial planners give you advice and stuff like that. But you got to keep in mind, a lot of these guys are, what, 22 years old. Now they got millions of dollars in their pockets. And they're thinking that this will never run out. So those guys are like, yeah, whatever, guys sneaking out of the meetings and, you know, getting away from it and trying to get out of practice. I mean, not out of practice, get out of the meetings so they can go home and do whatever they're going to do. They have things in place if you want the knowledge. NFL, PA, different people come in. But a lot of times you're so young, you can't really see, you know, so far down the line that this is, the lights are going to cut off. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, at the same time, it's like you're, you are on your own. You're a grown man. But reality is most of us are still playing video games and partying and running the streets. We're not really up on financial planners or investments and stuff like that. Very few guys are. A lot of the guys don't come from that type of background. I know, you know, um, I didn't, you know, I didn't know about stocks and bonds and how to run a business and, right. you know, paying taxes. I, I really didn't get educated on a lot of that type of stuff. So I had to learn a hard way on a lot of different things. My wife now, you know, she's worked, just about everywhere she, she's a jack of all trades and when we were dating and i actually got robbed by my neighbor out of big money we went into a real estate venture and i looked at the guys like my second father when i was living in ashbury my next door neighbor and literally him and his partner older two older black gentlemen all right and we're supposed to be uplifting each other and they literally ran game on me and stole a lot of money let's just say that thank god i made a lot of money but I didn't under, I never worked a job in my life outside of the NFL, never. So, you know, like I said, I put all my eggs in one basket and I didn't understand about paying taxes, getting money. I, I never, cause I neglected school. I didn't pay attention to all that stuff. I just played ball. Yeah. And my wife now, which was my girlfriend at the time, she came in and she explained everything to me and she organized everything for me. All of the paperwork when I had to go, you know, to um, 
court with these guys and different stuff. I didn't get my money back, but they got exposed for what they did. Sure. And she's the one that taught me a lot of this stuff about business and how it runs and taxes and getting your tax returns and all of that type of stuff. So, you know, um, you know, they, you know, I had to find out the hard way, simple as that, but they have stuff set up, but for the most part, guys just kind of do their own thing. And some guys win, some guys lose. And I think it's what, 70%, uh, over 70%, two to three years after they retire, they're going to go broke. And I remember the guys that I played with, some guys spending three and $4 million on cars, you know, dropping 150 grand in the casino in two nights. Uh, guys, you know, with multiple uh, baby mamas. And I'm not hating on this reality. And it was all cute back then. You know, you know, you got $3,000 in, I mean, $3 million in jewelry that you didn't spend through the year. It was cute back then. It was, you're the big time guy back then. Now, fast forward, a lot of those guys are downgrading houses and downgrading things just to try to make ends meet because they, you know, pretty much lost a lot of their money. And I'm blessed because we're upgrading, you know, from a nice size house to a much bigger house in Potomac, which is much more expensive area. So, you know, even though I went through some heartache and, and, and I'm not crying over it because I needed to learn those mistakes. And I'm going to tell you why. If I'd have just lost like, it, I, I'm not going to tell you the exact amount, but if I'd have just lost like $200,000 at the, the, that time, the money that I was making, that would have been nothing. Right. So I had to really lose a nice amount of money to wake me up from running around through the streets, you know, trying to sleep with everything that was out there from running around trying to party all the time and, you know, being focused on the wrong things. I had to actually start learning about how to manage the blessing that God gave me, you know, as far as from a financial standpoint. And thank God that I did go through those tough times and I made a lot of money throughout my career to where we still live a comfortable lifestyle. But I needed those growing pains to actually grow up. Yeah, sure. It sounds like you had really a really good base though coming home, you know, coming from the time you were little between mom and your older brothers. Mm -hmm. you know, it sounds like you had a great, you know, who Jack Johnson is NHL player. I know that name. I know that and name. Jack Johnson's parents robbed him of millions. His pain. That's so sad. Parents. His parents. Hmm. Um, Awful. So from a perspective of being a player, do you miss anything? Like, is there anything from the game that you miss still today, years later after being out of it? I just miss playing the game, you know, but I'm finally, I kind of, a few years ago, I finally put it to bed and, um, but I just miss playing and competing and, you know, uh, practice. I don't really so much miss, but just the excitement of the game and the crowd and, you know, the fans cheering for you, or we going to Philly and they're taunting us. And, you know, if we can go in there and get a win, now I'm taunting them back on the way out of the stadium, <laughs> you know, just when we would go in to play and, you know, we're on the bus and you see all of the fingers sticking up at you or, or the, the, the butt cheeks flashing at you. Philly's a nasty group now. And, you know, so I just miss the excitement of competing against different guys and playing. But one thing kind of, and I was even thinking about coming back at one point, and my wife would just laugh at me like, yeah, whatever, you know, you're too old now. So I was like, I'm going to show her. I'm going to get back in shape and go. And I know physically I could do it, but I was such at a high risk of getting paralyzed yeah. to where it would just, it wouldn't make sense at all, you know? And now, if I didn't have any money, then maybe I'd risk it to try to go back. But financially, I was set. I knew that, you know, my neck was in bad shape because it had gotten worse throughout my career. But um, I just miss competing and, you know, knocking guys on their butt. Every night, I just want to hit somebody. But now I can't hit them. But I think the thing that kind of helped me really put it to bed was now when I watch football, college, and pro, not so much high school. Every now and then you see a vicious hit. But I see some of the hits that these guys are putting on guys or they you know, are taking. I'm like, uh, is he gonna get up? Is his neck broke? Did he just tear his ankle up? Like, did he break it? So I'm in my head, like, thank God I'm out of that craziness. You know, my mind is not my mindset now. I can't, I don't think I can physically wrap my mind around or mentally wrap my mind around actually going out there and doing it now. You know, I can't do it now because I'm looking and I'm cringing just watching it on TV. But back when I was playing, it was nothing for me to run into the toughest guy on the field or the biggest guy. Who cares? You know, we're going to yeah. lay my body on the line. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you get back, though. You get back by coming and coaching the young the young bucks at the high school level. Um, talk, talk a little bit about that. I, I know it's been a, a great experience for you. I know, you know, like you said, you started out, what, coaching with your boy down, down in Alabama, 
Then you came up and you were working in Osborne Park for a while. Now you came into Montgomery County, Maryland, Churchill, Northwest High School, where you right. become uh, uh, acquaintances, friends through. Uh, tell me oh. about that. Okay, so I'll go through it briefly and then I'll talk a little bit more in detail once I move to Maryland and start coaching on the Maryland side. So once I retired, I'm, uh, I'll go through the end of my career. So I probably had five or six episodes of the spinal stenosis catching up with me when I played as a player, uh, you know, of incidents of getting hit, yeah. and going paralyzed, I've got to go to the doctor, get it rechecked out. Can I play? Should I play? Whatever, whatever. Finally, uh, we played the Carolina Panthers, um, my 10th season in the NFL and had a collision with a guy and everything went numb from head to toe, collapsed on the ground. I don't feel anything. And what really scared me this time was I tried to get up and I couldn't move. Normally I'm hurting and tingling, but I can move. And I'm, it, but I couldn't move. And I thought I was paralyzed. And I looked up and it was our trainer holding my helmet down. So when I tried to get up, I couldn't move. So I was like, Eric, I'm all right, let me get up, you know? And that was pretty much it. I knew I had to retire. So right away, I knew I wanted to get into coaching. The Shanahan's come in and they were really good to me. They didn't know me. And the owner put in a good word for me. You know, he wanted me to have a shot and opportunity. And I thank him for that. But the Shanahan's didn't like mistreat me by any means, you know? They welcomed me in. I would sit in meetings under these guys um, you know, uh, under Chris Forrester, um, John Embry, the tight end coach. So I'm in the O-line room and I wanted to learn the passing game. So I would go in the tight ends room. I would go sit with Keenan McCarter in the receivers room because I didn't understand the West Coast passing game. Yeah. It's concepts, it's words versus a numbered route tree system. And numbers, 989 F flat, it tells everybody where to go with the numbers. I know. So I didn't get it, but those guys taught me the pass game. And then I wanted to know quarterback play so I went to Kyle Shanahan himself. I said, Kyle, when we're done with the O-line meetings, you guys meet in the quarterback room another 30, 40 minutes. Is it okay if I come in and learn the passing game? Kyle's like, sure, dude, come on in. So now I was going that meeting. I started learning quarterback play. So I learned a lot there. And then I went down to help my buddy at Blunt High School coordinator. We had a really good season. Went to Alabama, you know, for three years to two years as a student coach, just running scout team. And my pride and joy for running a scout team is when I can actually get these scout team guys, most of them walk-ons, to actually score on Nick Saban's defense, yeah. you know? And we would do it. And I would kind of, like, celebrate, make noise, just to try to get under his skin a little bit. Because, you know, his defense, number one defense in the nation. Uh -huh. So if I can get these walk-ons to score on him, I'm doing a good job. Yeah. So sure. um, I did my thing there for two years, graduated, made straight A's. I never thought I could do that in my life, but I was a grown man. I didn't have time to play at that time. You know, and I did my thing and made straight A's. And then he hired me as player development. So from there, me and my wife, you know, we was like, all right, Tuscaloosa is cool during football season, but out of football season, it's a little bit boring here. Yeah. And she, you know, she had one or two good friends there that she met, and it was coaches' wives. It was actually Mario Cristobal. Oh, wow. Jeff, that's why. Yeah, yeah. And then it's a guy named Kerry Colbert. He's the wide receivers coach at USC. He played in the NFL too. He went to USC, but he's the receivers coach at USC. And his and his wife Safia, so they were like really really tight. And then she met like some local friends around there too. And but at the end of the day, the small town just wasn't doing this for us anymore. We wanted to move back home, so we moved back to Vienna, Virginia. And I started looking for a high school job, so I took the job at Osborne, not Osborne Park, but Osborne High School. Okay, okay. And I coached there for two years. They hired me. Uh, we we did, we did okay. I'll be honest. Uh, the athletes that they used to have back in the day, that area is definitely changed you know it's more of a hispanic culture now you know spent like you know so you know a lot of the good athletes kind of moved out of the area and we had a few good ones you know one of my pride and joys is chris thornton and he's at um james madison he's an outstanding athlete i mean outstanding he had 96 catches his senior year i mean he was really good ran it like a 4 4 40 and then from there we wind up you know we wound up moving to potomac maryland after those two years of coaching there, i was a head coach at osborne and when I moved to the area, you know where I almost coached at? Where at? QO. Oh. Or, or Bullis. It was it was between one and the two. One of my wife's friends at the time introduced me to the Bullis coach because her daughter went to Bullis. I know, Pat. And he said, you can have the old line job right now. Yeah, I know, Pat. I know. Yeah, so I was like, golly, I know, you know, I've never really just coached O-line. I've always been a coordinator on a high school level. And I thought about it hard. I was thinking about going. 
So I talked to uh, Coach Kelly at QO, which I admire both programs, both coaches. They do a great job, yeah, especially, you know, QO for a public school, you know. And he said, well, you can be the tackles and tight ends, Coach, and then you can kind of show him, you know, to, you know, work with the coordinator on schemes that you ran in the past. And and I thought about that. I was like, yeah, but I was like, I think I just, in my head, I was like, I'd be bored not calling plays in the game, you know, just coaching my guy. And I know I would do a hell of a job, but I'd be bored, not just being selfish about it, but I'm a coordinator. Right. So I wound up meeting another guy and he just quit coaching at um, Churchill and I met him in the Gold's gym. And he said, yeah, you know, they got a cool coach, Willie Williams, playing in the league. I can link you up with him if you want to consider it. So I reach out to Willie. We're talking. And he already had a coordinator, a guy named Q. And he's an older gentleman. And Q told and, – and Willie was like, I don't think I'm going to get him, man. I'm, be, I'm not going to be able to get Chris because I know Chris want to be a coordinator. Q was cool. He told – he said, listen. He said, I'll step aside and just coach receivers. Let him come be the coordinator. I don't have a problem with that. Yeah. So I could have went to QO, we won a state championship. I could have went to Bullets, we probably won a championship. And I went to uh, Churchill because I knew Churchill's program used to be really good. Then they're going through a time of struggling. And I said, I, I want to show people on this side, you know, in Maryland, what I can do as a coordinator. Sure. So if I go to these other places, I'm just coaching a position group and that's it. So I went to Churchill. My first year there, we went five and five. They approved from... I think I think they went two and seven. It was like not a good record at all. But we improved. I think it went two and seven or uh, no, it was two and nine for two years straight, something yeah. like that. When I got there, we improved to five and five, and it was all of us coaches, not just me. And then when the kids really figured that offense out that I was putting in, and we had a really good class, that's when we went nine and two. The only losses that we had was the Northwest West. regular season, and then in the playoffs. Now, in the playoffs, you guys just crushed his hands down. I think we woke you guys up yeah. because the big powerhouse Northwest with all of the pretty athletes, and we had some good athletes as well, but you guys were a little bit more stacked than we, we were. And I think the first time we played you guys, you guys were looking just at teams like QO or Richard Montgomery. Yeah. When you guys rolled into our stadium, we gave y'all fits. I mean, it was 21-7, I think, in the first half. We came back and tied the game up. You know, and we almost beat you guys if we don't drop those two late balls late in the game. So I wanted to prove to people that I knew what I was doing with offense, coaching, you know, the schematics and breaking down tape and scheming. And, you know, I was unhappy about a few things after my two years there at Churchill and uh, nothing against the school or anything, but just some some little things, you know, uh, that, you know, I did, I disagreed with. Let me just say that. And, 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 and I wound up, you know, reaching out other places and, um, you know, I found a home at Northwest and I'm happy there. Um, and that's pretty much it. You know, last year we had a great year. Uh, QO beat us the first time. Uh, I thought Bucky did an outstanding job defensively, 17-7. They beat us. I didn't do a great job. I put our kids in a bad situation throwing the ball too much. I had no clue that number 44 on QO's team was that good. Yeah. We, we were struggling pass protection against them. And, you know, I had to, you know, learn the hard way. I was a little bit stubborn. And then uh, the second time around, we put in a different game plan and we got after them pretty good. And beating QO in the semifinals was huge. And we're in their house, you know, and we wind up taking them down, you know, and they're talking a bunch of smack. And then unfortunately we lost the wives, but I feel like for our first year, you know, my first year at Northwest, we had an outstanding season and guys got scholarships and they're going off to school, you know? I, I think the mentality that you, and the coaching staff bring um, such such your part. Same at QO. Um, Bullis was not Bullis back before Pat got there. They weren't anything to, you know, you just kind of saw Bullis as Bullis. But uh, going back to Churchill, when I was a head coach at Rockville, uh, I had built a relationship with the guy there, uh, Nugbaum, Nubom, something like that. He ran a triple option. Mm -hmm. And, and then uh, Willie was two coaches, two coaches after him, but – his triple option, they were pretty good. They were like seven and three in the county. Yeah, it, it, isn't he at Watkins Mills now that got to run the triple option? No, it was the guy before oh. him that put it in place. And then Joe okay, came okay. there after him. Yeah, okay. I know the guy well, you're talking the same about. System. But yeah, I heard that triple option. I know for a fact triple option is a beast because I watch teams, and I know uh, Georgia Tech changed their scheme now. Yeah. But I would watch Georgia Tech, Army, and Navy, and 
these schools or whatever, and they don't really have the great athletes overall, but they got tough guys. Yeah. But the problem is a lot of teams don't see this triple option stuff, so they don't know how to defend it. That's and the, and, and if, yeah, if one guy's out of place, you're in trouble. The first thing you better do is stop the dive. Because yep. they'll take four yards in a cloud of dust every time now. So if you stop the dive, now you got to worry about the pit, the quarterback. Then you got to worry about the pitch, man. And then when you finally figure all that out, then they run a play action and go over your head. It's a difficult scheme to stop now. I, I recently found out that uh, Paul Johnson had gone up to Baltimore in the offseason, and he worked some with them, even though they run more of the read option type stuff. They put right. in some of that. That triple option stuff I saw last week, it was more of a speed option. Last mm -hmm. time the Tours and Ravens played, I saw it. I was like, whoa. You know, and then I was speaking with somebody, and they were telling me that Paul Johnson went up there and worked some with them to actually implement some that. of that mentality. Yeah. But, I mean, if you're not playing, if you're not playing your assignment, you're done. You, you're That's right. You're out done. You know, it's like playing against the wing team. If you don't know what to do to defend it, you're done. You are done, and 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 when you go to the wing T, and it's a great offense too. It's very yeah. simple. But it's a great offense. First thing you better do is stop the trap and stop the dive to the fullback. Yeah. Or they'll take their four yards and a cloud of dust, and then eventually in the third quarter, that's forty yards. Yeah. So you better stop that and then worry about everything else later. Follow the triangle. That's all. Yeah. The yeah. guard to the fullback will take you home every time, right, coach? Yeah. Every that's time. right. That's right. Well, you see any young Chris Samuels uh, at a place in, in Northwest right now? Is there a young Chris Samuels on that team? Mm. Mentally, maybe not so much physically. Uh, one one guy this past season that I felt like it's two guys actually. Re remember Samuel Sandy? I yeah, think it's Sandy his last name. When I first got there, Samuel had played a little bit, but then he wound up losing his job his junior year and didn't play that much. But I saw something special in him right away. The guy is a strong kid. He has a thick body, thick legs, and he's very flexible. The most flexible guy on the team. I said, the problem is he just needs to be taught more. And he needs to be pushed and challenged more. Yeah. He wound up being one of my best linemen this past year. Yeah. And then also, too, a guy that I, got, I, I really like. I can't think of his last name. He was a younger kid. He was a sophomore. Spencer. Oh, Spencer, uh, Spencer Adams. Yes. He kind of reminds me of me. He has all of the tools to be really, really good. He's big. He's strong. But the problem is his mind is weak. That's his thing. You know, if you yell at him too much, you get frustrated. His eyes would tear up, you know. So the mental part is not there yet. And you know what? He reminded me of myself. So I didn't beat him up over that. I didn't tease him or mistreat him or yell at him. I just worked with him. Yeah. And then I told him and I told him my story of when I used to be the big guy that mentally wasn't strong minded enough to handle yelling, to handle the 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 the, the competition of the game at that point on a varsity level. And I said, so we're gonna work on what, Spencer? He said, mental toughness. And I would always kind of re remind him of that. What are we gonna work on? Mental toughness, coach. Look me in my eyes, him, mental toughness coach. And before long, who's actually playing in some of the games? And he started one game and played the whole game because I think we had either an injury problem or a discipline problem or something. And coach says, we're starting him. And I'm in my head like, oh, coach, you know, because I want my offense to score a 1,000 points a game. Yeah, cool. So I want my best guys out there. Luba I said, no. He said, that kid is going to have to play one day. Uh, and right now, he needs to get some experience. He started the whole game and played great. But he reminded me of myself, has all of the tools, but mentally weak. So my whole thing is I'm working on his mind. I'm working on his mind. And unfortunately, COVID hits and we can't play this year. But he, I was relying on him to start. And I thought he would have played great for us as well. I see him three times a week. He's in my class two, three times yeah. a week. And he's very – he. I think he's starting to get that piece of it. You know, we, we have conversation. He always comes into class early with me. We have that conversation. I've always had that relationship with him. He's been – I had him last year too. Um, and I knew him when he was a freshman before I even had him in class. You know, right. this was that kid who came up and built a relationship with me. You know, I work with y'all from, from a distance, but I mentor those kids and stuff. No doubt. He was a kid who who got it. Like he you keep working with him, coach. He's gonna be a special kid. I know he no, is. Never. I mean, he's huge, but he's not a fat kid. He's huge but muscular, very yeah. toned up for a big man. And and all he needs is, is confidence and be taught with the, and to be taught. 
after that, he's going to take off and, and be, they label me a sleeper coming out because it's like, all right, this guy might blow up and do something special the way he runs, his size, but we'll have to wait and see what happens. That's Spencer to me. Yeah. And, and the only thing holding him back is, is, is his mind. Once he checks that and that, you know, does, you know, it, it does what it, sh it should be doing as far as being confident and, you know, ready to go to war and all of that and not backing down from anything, adversity or whatever, yelling or fussing, you man up and just go through it. He's going to be unstoppable. I've always taught the kids, and I'm sure you do the same thing. It's okay to be the nicest guy off the field, but when you put pads on, it's on. You got to be the meanest guy on the field yeah, at that time. Exactly. And, and he, and like you say, he's a wonderful young man, very respectful, uh, just a great kid. Yeah. So he's going to get it, and I, I believe in that. Coach, if you weren't, if you weren't so deeply embedded in football, whether it's when you were a player or as a coach now, what, what do you think you would have done? Probably uh, on my own fishing show because <laughs> I nice. love fishing. <laughs> I did not know that about you. Yeah, I'll be honest. Uh, I don't really know. Um, I mean, I would do that if I could, but football was everything, and then coaching football was everything afterwards. Honestly, probably on my own fishing show <laughs> or a PE teacher. A PE teacher is great. I love it. Yeah, I love doing it because you you talk about building relationships with people and teaching them mental toughness and all that stuff. We do mm -hmm. that uh, in PE. I teach PE, health, and first aid classes, and I get the same kids at least twice, whether it's and, PE and health or PE and first aid. Right, and, and especially with now, you know, like my kid, and I'm going to have to get on my oldest son because he used to work out with me down in the gym, and then I fell off for a while because I injured my knee, so he totally fell off now. Yeah. He don't want to do anything but play the iPad. But uh, I got to get on him and get him back active into it. But the now generation, these kids are not running around in the streets playing like we used to. We were building tree houses, hiking five miles back in the woods, swimming in creeks in our underwear. You know, we were playing football every day, some pickup game or basketball, whatever. So now, you know, it's important for, you know, you as a, a, a PE coach or whatever and all of the, you know, the PE coaches to teach them how to get some physical activity yeah. so that way the kids are not so obese, you know, and – they don't have health issues and stuff like that. So it's definitely important. People kind of overlook that part of, you know, being a teacher, you know, and they think it's all about math, science, this and that, but you have to be healthy as well. Yeah. I, I will give a shout out to my son right here. My son, Vincent, absolutely cannot sit still. Does he play video games? Yeah. Does he look at the iPad? Yeah. But that boy would much rather be on the street. He comes in and grabs me every day in between uh, uh, his classes when he has his lunch break. Let's go throw football. Let's catch uh, baseball. And that's then awesome. when class is over, he's in our neighbor's house jumping on a trampoline, playing. You know, he really, he's a very active kid. So you keep working with your boy. I'm sure that's going to come along. Coach, the final segment that I want to do with you is it's called Decade Definers. I want you to name for me the five top defensive linemen you faced in your career. It could be in college. It could be some dude you faced in high school or in the league. The I'll name guy. one guy, and I played great against him. I think I was a redshirt junior at the time, and we played Tennessee in Tennessee. Remember Leonard Little? Yeah, absolutely. Leonard was a beast. I mean, he was strong. He was fast. I mean, he was unbelievable. And I locked him down. He didn't beat me one time. And he would flip sides. So I probably went against him maybe about a good eight to nine times in that game. And I guess the coach figured it out. He ain't beating that young buck over there, so they sent him back on the other side. And then uh, in the pros, to probably label it down the list, I'm going to start with Dwight Freeney. I mean, he was a complete animal. And the thing that made him so special was he had the, one of the quickest get-offs, you know, from a defensive end. His first four or five steps was unbelievable. And then he had this powerful bull rush because he wasn't that tall. And he had these thick legs. So he would literally get up under you and jack you up and walk you back to the quarterback. So finally, when he bull rushes you one or two times, and you're like, all right, I'm going to uh, anchor down and hunker down and stop this bull rush. And I'm going to sit on it. Now here comes the spin move. Yeah. And his spin move was second to none. I mean, he was the best at it. And then when you finally say, all right, I got to stop the bull rush and the spin move, then he would beat you with speed upfield and dip up under your hands and sack the quarterback. So Dwight Freeney, by far, number one. And then, uh, luckily, I caught this guy when he was young, first coming in the league, and I dominated him 
the first two or three times I played against him, then he started getting me as I got older and he started coming into his own. DeMarcus Ware. Oh, geez. Yeah, DeMarcus was unbelievable. Great power, speed to power, um, bull rush, uh, the dip underneath going around. I mean, he was an outstanding athlete. And here I am, this big time Alabama guy. He just went to Troy State, you know? Yeah. So yeah. he came into the league and Parcells knew what he was doing when he drafted him. He knew. And now the guy's going to be, you know, first ballot Hall of Fame one day, outstanding guy, person, and football player. Second, I mean, third, I will have to go another Troy State guy, O.C. Human Year with the Giants. Oh, I remember. Just okay. a complete animal, high motor. Uh, always had a chip on his shoulder. Always had something to prove. Not the biggest guy. Phenomenal defensive man. Really good player. He was always tough to go against. Had really good hand play, how to slap hands and get your hands off of him. Um, after that, I, uh, probably Peppers that used to play with Carolina. I mean, just a, he was big like me and powerful and fast as I don't know what. So those guys, and then even Trent Cole with um, with Philly. Yeah, uh, I think that was just Trent Cole. He was, you know, he didn't. He wasn't as crafty with a whole lot of moves like those guys. But the one thing that he had was he never took a playoff. High motor, always going hard. And then even going back to my rookie year my first two or three years in the league. Remember Hugh Douglas in Philly? Yeah. Yeah. He was a beast too. Luckily, he caught me with my first year when I was young and, and got me. And then later on, I started getting him because he was getting older in his career. That's just kind of the way it works. Interesting group of guys you just named there, Coach. I, I know that Giants D-line that, you know, Umagura played on, man, that was killer D-line right there. Yeah, that's straight hand, tuck. Um, you and your, I mean, they, they were loaded. Coach, I want to thank you for, for giving me some of your time. Make sure you thank your wife, too, for, for uh, allowing you to step away. I know I know you all got it going on with the kids and working with mm -hmm. them and all that. I, I really appreciate it. Um, I look forward to catching up with you again real soon, not only speaking with you or texting with you, but seeing you in person. Um, fingers across, we get high school football rolling again for you. And uh, you, uh, you take care of yourself, okay? I will. Thank you so much. I know we've been kind of missing each other for, you know, months now. And yeah. we're supposed to have done this a long time ago. But it's, it was fun. It was great. And we'll definitely do it again. I appreciate it, Coach. Mm -hmm.